in the documentary Moonshot, astronaut Alan Shepard described a conversation he had with his father after the Apollo 14 moon landing. His father said, son, you remember in 1959 when, I told you, when you told me you were going to be an astronaut and I told you I was against it? Well, I was wrong. Shepard was so moved as he concluded this story that his eyes welled with tears and he had a lump in his throat the size of Texas. We're talking about Alan Shepard here, the Alan Shepard, first American in space, only American to hit a golf ball on the moon, uh, a real American hero, and here was Shepard, 71 at the time, telling this story about a backdoor blessing he received from his father and he gets choked up beyond words. We never get beyond the need for a father's blessing. It may come early and often, it may come late, it may never come at all, but there's something inside each one of us that longs for the blessing. On two occasions, in the Gospels, Father God blesses Son Jesus at his baptism and at his transfiguration. This is my beloved Son. He pleases me. The Father and Son understand the power of blessing. As we continue our Fresh Start series, we're thinking today about getting a fresh start in our parenting. And we're gonna think together about doing that through the power of blessing. Do you know that the Bible devotes almost two chapters to the blessings that Jacob passed down to his children and his grandchildren? I invite you to open your Bible to Genesis chapter 49, verse 28. Genesis 49, 28. In chapter 48, Jacob blesses two of his grandchildren, Joseph's two boys. And then in chapter 49, Jacob gathers his sons around him, 12 sons in all, and blesses them too. These blessings are more than a casual pat on the back, more than a pep talk. They are more than slogans like, go get them, tiger, or you're a chip off the old block. These blessings had depth and they had power. There's something formal about them, and when we read them, we get the idea that this is a big deal. And when the blessings have been pronounced, the author sums it all up in our one verse text. Hear the word of the Lord. These are the tribes of Israel, 12 in all, and this is what their father said to them. He blessed them, and he blessed each one with a suitable blessing. Jacob knew the importance of the blessing. You may recall he was born second to his twin brother Esau, bad news in that culture because the firstborn son got the birthright and the best blessing. But Jacob refused to settle for leftovers. He was determined to be son number one. The Bible says that when Esau emerged from Rebekah's womb, Jacob had a hand on his heel as if he was trying to pull Esau back so he could come out first. And the competition that began at birth continued throughout their lives. Though twin brothers, the two couldn't have been more different. Esau was a hunter and a woodsman. May have been a slob, probably burped at the table. He's the kid who had breakfast on his face, spaghetti sauce on his shirt, the kid whose room was in shambles, the one who loved to be outside and often came home with dirt under his fingernails and sweat beads in his neck, dragging some dead critter behind him. He was a daddy's boy. Jacob was more a mama's boy. Minded his manners, never had to ask him to take a bath. He preferred a more domestic life, like to cook with his mom in the kitchen. Jacob was clever and cunning, cunning too. He used brains over brawn, and he was able to dupe his dopey brother without breaking a sweat. That's how Jacob got the birthright. Esau came in from the deer stand with nothing to show for it. No deer, no nothing, and he was hungry. Esau was always hungry. Jacob was stirring a pot of stew over the open fire. Esau smelled it. Esau wanted it. Esau bought it. Jacob sold it to him for the price of his birthright. But that wasn't good enough for Jacob or his mother. She brewed up a plan to help Jacob steal his brother's blessing too. Isaac told Esau to go get some wild game and to fix it for him, and then he would give Esau his blessing. Well, Jacob's mother eavesdropped on that conversation and contravened her husband. Maybe Rebecca schemed this stunt to help fulfill what God told her when her twins were jostling in the womb. God said the older will serve the younger. Whatever her motivation, 
While Esau was traipsing around in the woods looking for something to kill, she dressed Jacob up to look like Esau, to feel like Esau, to smell of the wilderness like Esau. She cooked up some of his daddy's favorite food, had Jacob take it to him. Isaac, now old, now blind, suspicious, but finally believed that Jacob was Esau, and he gave Jacob Esau's blessing. Jacob knew enough about the importance of the blessing to trick his own daddy to steal it. How, how powerful is the blessing? Well, Esau found out what Jacob had done and listened to what the Bible says in Genesis 27, 34. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me too, my father. How heart-wrenching is that? Isaac went on to give Esau a blessing, but Jacob stole the original blessing, the better blessing that Isaac intended for Esau. Esau threatened to kill Jacob for that, so Jacob hightailed it to his uncle Laban long ways away in Haran. Now in the next many years, Jacob grew up and got married and had children, and through a series of ups and downs, Jacob matured, he settled down, grew close to God, he even reconciled with Esau, and now an old man, he could hear the footsteps of death gaining on him every day. He determined it was time to pass down some blessings of his own. His best blessings went to his son Joseph and to his two boys, Manasseh and Ephraim. Jacob passed down the promises of God that he had inherited from his father. So with hands resting on their heads, Jacob said, in them let my name be carried on in the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. These were the, the best promises, the highest blessings. In that culture, Jacob had the right to give blessings to whomever he pleased, but the rest of his sons got their blessings too. Jacob didn't forget them, he blessed them. Now there's encouragement in that for us because this means you don't have to be a perfect parent to pass on the blessing. Jacob was far from a perfect father. He could be a schemer and a con man. He stooped so low as to manipulate his old blind father to give him something that wasn't his to take. And when Jacob became a parent, he brought all those flaws to the job. Though he had 12 sons, Joseph and Benjamin, the sons of his favorite wife, Rachel, were his favorite two sons. His 10 other sons lived in the shadow of those two. They, they were the, the two. Joseph and Benjamin got to shop at Dillard's. The other 10 had to go get their clothes at whatever local thrift stores they could find. And, and when they had chicken for supper, Joseph and Benjamin got the breasts and the drumsticks while the others had to eat the backs and the necks and the gizzards. Jacob didn't try to hide this. Only Joseph and Benjamin, only those two measured up. That created a lot of tension among the boys. Jacob's favoritism created this mess he was not a perfect parent by any measure, but who is? Are you? Is, of course, somebody said, <laughs> I heard that. <laughs> Isn't every mother and father a curious mixture of shadow and light? I mean, there are many wonderful moms and dads right here in this congregation, parents who set great examples for their kids, who are involved in their lives, who love them without condition, but not one of us is perfect. We all have our faults, our weaknesses, our sins that are open and secret. And if you're like Dana and me and your kids turn out the, the way that you hope and pray that they will, you don't pat yourself on the back. You give all praise and glory to God. All parents have faults but that does not disqualify us from blessing our children. We can still pass on the blessing and our children can still receive it gladly. Don't think for a moment that Jacob's grown up sons didn't hang on his every word as he blessed them. They knew his faults all too well, but his blessing meant everything to him and that's one thing that the centuries between Jacob and us have never changed. I grew up in a, in a home that, that was divided by divorce. After the third grade, I didn't see my father much, and my mother was the source of whatever blessing and encouragement I received. My father largely uninvolved in my life. I'd witnessed his weaknesses. I'd felt the sting of his faults. But in our last phone conversation we had, he was in his hospital deathbed. We talked, it was the day before he died, before he hung up. He said, John Scott, he said, I've always loved you. 
And after his death, I found this prayer that he had in a drawer in his apartment, a prayer he had written for me. And I needed that blessing more than I knew. It helped me put a piece of the puzzle of my life in place that made the picture more clear and a little more complete. I could have resisted his blessing. I guess I could have said he hardly knew me. Who cares what he says? But I couldn't. Despite our relationship history, there was something inside of me that hung on every word. Something inside of me that needed every word. He gave it, I received it, and I was blessed. Like my dad, like me. You're not a perfect parent, your kids know this, but don't let it keep you from passing on the blessing. Your weaknesses, they don't, they don't disqualify you. Children need their parents' blessings. And imperfect parents can pass on the blessings. If you've never blessed your children, this could provide a fresh start in your parenting, no matter how old your kids are, even if they have kids of their own. Not too late. The blessings that seat deepest in the heart come from a parent who, who knows her children, his children. I mean, did you notice what our text says about Jacob's blessings? These are the tribes of Israel, 12 in all, and this is what their father said to them. He blessed them, and he blessed each one with a suitable blessing. No blanket blessings here, no one-size-fits-all blessings here. Jacob knew his children well enough to give each a blessing tailored to that particular son. The best blessings, the most suitable blessings come through a father who knows his children, a mother who knows what makes her kids tick. Parents, do you know your children? However old they are, do you know your children? What makes them laugh? What makes them cry? Do you know their dreams, their hopes, their joys, their fears? Do you know what lights their fire? This kind of knowledge seems to come more natural to moms. Dads may have to work at it a bit more, so dad, work at it. Take time to know your children. This knowledge helps you shape a blessing suitable for your child. But, but how do we do it? How do we move beyond the desire to the deed? In their book, book The Blessing, Gary Smalley and John Trent offer some practical ways to pass on the blessing. And here's, here's a little bit of their counsel. One way to offer blessing is meaningful touch. Meaningful touch. In Genesis 48, Jacob places his hands on the heads of his grandchildren as he offers the blessings. There's something very meaningful about that kind of touch. Uh, some years ago, when we worked our mission partnership on the Indian Reservation in Pine Ridge, South Dakota, uh, working with the Lakota Sioux, uh, we met a a Lakota Sioux named Delane Nonek. Some of you who were a part of that partnership, you may remember Delane. I met him one afternoon when he came by our work, set, work site on the reservation. I was digging up concrete, breaking a sweat, sweating like a dog, a real mess. But he introduced himself to me and he didn't, I held out my hand, but he, he didn't shake hands. First, he put the back of his hand to my forehead. Then he grabbed my head and pulled it down to his forehead to forehead. Then he made the sign of the cross on my head. And then he reached up and he pulled my nose. And then he grabbed my, my wrist and, and rubbed my arm. And honestly, that touch was a little too meaningful for me in that particular moment. <laughs> but, but for the rest of the time we were there, Delane would go through that ritual almost every time he saw us. I thought, was this some kind of tribal custom? It wasn't. I came to learn that when Delane was a child, he was very sick, and he spent much of his life in a hospital being cared for by nuns who took his temperature, who checked his pulse, who played the I got your nose game, and who often made the sign of the cross on his forehead. For Delane, those touches were signs of affection. It was his way to offer a meaningful touch, his way to offer a blessing. There's blessing in meaningful touch. A hug, an arm about the shoulder, holding our children in our laps, a playful Dutch rub, Eskimo kiss, butterfly kiss, even a regular kiss. Meaningful touch communicates love, acceptance, blessing. You say, well, I'm not much of a touchy-feely person. Well, work on it. Learn how to bless your children with a meaningful touch. Another way to pass the blessings through verbal affirmation. 
We talked two or three weeks ago about life words. Use those words liberally because they give life. They give courage, confidence. Children need, need, they, they need and long to hear their parents say things. I don't care how old they are. Like, I'm proud of you. Great job. I need you. I trust you. You rock. Stuff like that, spoken or written in a note, when offered from a sincere heart, become medicine for the souls of our children. They bless the heart beyond measure. And we can also pass the blessing along when we communicate value to our children. To bless means to honor, so we honor our children by showing them how valuable they are to us, giving them some time, some attention, uh, giving, looking at them in the eye when we listen to them and talk with them. Notice who they are, notice what they do, compliment them, encourage them, and respect them enough to discipline them when they need it and pray over them. Please let your children, let your children hear you talk to God about them in their presence. My mother used to do that for me. It attaches value to your children, so communicate that value. How about out of the blue and for no particular reason, you just say to your child, sometimes I have to pinch myself to realize I'm not dreaming that God would give me a a child like you. Or how about saying, I can't, I can't tell you how thankful I am to be your mom. Little things said and done, planned and spontaneous, that communicate value to your children is a form of blessing and they will not forget it. Still another way we can pass on the blessing is to picture a positive future for our children. That's what Jacob did in chapter 49 for his sons. Reuben, he said, you're gonna excel in honor and praise. Judah, you're going to be a ruler who conquers his enemies. Issachar, you're going to be a hard worker. Dan, you're going to provide justice for your people. And Asher, you're going to enjoy rich food. On and on, Jacob pronounced the blessings of a positive future for his children. And we, we can do that too. You, you really love people. I wouldn't be surprised if you become a doctor or a teacher or a pastor or, or do something in your life that really helps people. Uh, your music... Man, it just helps people worship. You're going to be a blessing to the church your whole life long. Uh, you have a heart for the people that nobody notices. I wouldn't be surprised if God makes a missionary out of you. And the way you love animals, you'd make a great veterinarian. Uh, you want to be a policeman? Well, that means you're courageous. Picturing a positive future for our kids is a tremendous means of blessing because too many parents, you know some, maybe you have been one, destroy the confidence of their children by, by communicating they can't do anything right and, and they become dream crushers. Well, you better get that nonsense out of your head, kid. Folks like us never do things like that, so don't set yourself up for disappointment and failure. A lot of kids get that message and they come up short of what, what they could be with a little blessing. Bless your children. Picture a positive future for them. Lots of ways to pass the blessing on to your children. And, and we need to be ready to pass the blessing on to those who aren't our children. Passing on the blessings, not just for parents. Anybody can do this. You know people, children and adults, whose parents are no longer around to bless them or whose parents appear incapable or unwilling to bless them. Must these people live forever? without the blessing. It, it may not have quite the power of a parent's blessing, but any significant adult in a person's life can pass on a blessing that has liberating power. I still remember a blessing given to me by my fifth grade teacher, Miss Dennis, 55 years ago. I still remember it. Fred Craddock tells a story about meeting an old man named Ben Hooper in a roadside diner in Outback, Tennessee. Old man was curious about Craddock, and when he found out Craddock was a preacher, he told Craddock this story. He said, I was born out of wedlock, small town, became the subject of gossip and, and the stares of people, and I knew what they were doing. They were trying to figure out who my daddy was. He was awkward, he was shy, didn't have many friends, didn't mingle much with others. But when he was a teenager, something urged him to go visit a church. And, and so he did, and he really liked the preacher. So he would come early, or come late, and he would leave early. But he kept coming back. And now listen to, to him tell his story. He said, one Sunday, people clogged up the aisle before I could get out, and I was stopped. 
Before I could make my way through the group, I felt a hand on my shoulder, a heavy hand. It was that minister. I cut my eyes around and I caught a bit of his nose and his beard. I knew who it was. I trembled in fear. He turned his face around so he could see mine and he just, he just seemed to be staring at me for a little while and I knew what he was doing. He was gonna make a guess as to who my father was. A moment later he said, well, boy, you're a child of, and then he paused right there, and I knew it was coming. I knew I'd have my feelings hurt. I knew I would never come back here again. He said, you're a child of God. I can see the resemblance. And then he swatted me on the backside and said, now go claim your inheritance. He said, I walked out of that church that day a different person than I was when I went in. Craddock was so moved by the story, he said, what's your name? The man said, Ben Hooper, and Craddock, who was a Tennessee native, said he remembered his father talking when he was just a boy about this illegitimate child that grew up to be the governor of Tennessee for two terms. Maybe you've noticed that I try to give a blessing to folks that we baptize. I like to bless people. I think it's because of the blessing I received when Jesus found me, a hurting child with no daddy in my life. And he said, boy, I want to be your father. I gave my son Jesus to die for your sins. I raised him from the dead. And if you'll turn from your sins and you'll trust that what he did on the cross, he did for you, I will make you my son. I choose you, boy. I've always wanted a son like you. And I wanted a father like him, so I trusted Jesus and he gave me a blessing and he gives me a blessing over and over. Like when it's time to preach and I stand up here feeling like I got nothing and the Lord whispers, you got me and I got you. You just preach what I give you and I'll use it in ways that bless way more than you know. He blesses me. Or like when the Lord sends me to deal with those whose troubles are way over my head. And as I wonder what good I did, the Lord speaks into my helplessness and he whispers, I sent you and you showed up. It's over your head, but it's not over mine. Trust me, son, trust me. I'm very good at doing more than you can ask or imagine. He blesses me. Over and over, he blesses me. And he invites me to pass that blessing on to everyone I can, everywhere I can the power of blessing. You can do this. You can do this. Parents, you can do this for your children, but you don't have to be a parent. You don't have to be eloquent. You don't have to be clever. You don't need to keep, you, you, you don't have, to, have, to, have to, to, to be perfect in the words you shape. You just need to have an ear tuned to God's spirit. You just need to love someone enough to offer a word, an action, a touch of blessing. His words come will become your words and your blessing will become his blessing and change life. So you want a fresh start in your parenting, then bless your kids, whether they're four or 14 or 40. Bless them. And while you're at it, if you're not a parent, keep your antenna up for opportunities to bless your friends, your friend's kids, the kid you coach, the marginalized person in your connect group, even a gas station attendant or some random stranger you meet on the street. You will become like the voice of God in people's ears and you will do more than you know. More good that you will not realize till heaven as you encourage your children and others to go claim their inheritance in Christ. First blog ever posted back when I started blogging, Thanksgiving 2009, a long time ago. A title that count your many blessers because God has given me many blessers. I named a few of those blessers in that blog. And I hope that when my kids someday take time to count their blessing, blessers, I hope that I'll be on their list. It's not too late for you to make your kids list. God has blessed you. Now go and pass that blessing on to others. Father, for some of us, this is kind of weird that we don't feel confident in doing this. And for some of us, it's hard because we've not really received a blessing ourselves. 
So would you give your blessing to everyone in this room? Settle your blessing. Give them a word in their mind, in their heart of blessing today. (laughs) And help them to go past the blessing on to others. We can start in the home, but we don't end there. So Father, use us to make a positive difference in the lives of the people you put in our circles of, of care and love and influence. In Jesus' name, amen.